opera, very she she. Very she she. And the fashion industry, and also been a what did you tell me, Deborah Comptroller? Oh, um, my job for money, as I was an actor, we all need jobs for money. I worked for a company that designed sets for fashion shows, which is why I dressed fashion for so long. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. And we went from you know I got to answer the phones twelve hours a week, and when I left the company, I was the Comptroller. Oh, great. Well, Deborah um, is a wonderful, strong, and talented female, and uh, she's with us today on Thursday. And the topic for today is F U C K ing. And you all know that I sometimes have a problem saying that word. I don't. And um, so, uh, but under that topic of sex, we decided to bring it to uh, a pertinent topic that's been happening lately and it's called sexual harassment in the workplace and um, what many women are thinking about which is what should I do if I think I am being sexually harassed and to help us explore that topic we have two wonderful guest experts today we have Rory McAvoy who is a partner at at Ackerman law firm who practices in the area in the area of labor and employment and Cecilia Ayersman, who is an associate at Ackerman and also practices in the same area. So thank you both for coming today and welcome. Thank nice. you for having us. Nice oh. to be here. So we thought that uh, the first way to wrap our, our heads around this, this topic was to just basically first define or answer for people like in, in legal terms, what is sexual harassment? So sexual harassment is a form of gender-based discrimination. It's illegal under the federal law, under our state law here in New York, as well as under the city law. So New York City also has its own set of laws that you know, addresses this issue. And there are two forms of sexual harassment. So you see it in the news and you think, you know, I see this every day, it's just sexual harassment. Well, under the law, we have two categories. So we have, because we're lawyers and love our Latin, we have quid pro quo, which really is just a fancy way of saying this for that. So I do something, I get something. If I you know, sleep with my boss, I get a promotion. If I don't sleep with my boss, you know, maybe he gives me the worst work assignments. Maybe I'm stuck there all night with horrible assignments and I can't leave to get my kids now. Mm. Um, or, or maybe you get fired. Or I get fired, yeah. Um, so there, that's quid pro quo. And then we have... Um, Hostile environment. Thank you. Sorry. A hostile work environment, which is an intimidating, hostile, offensive work environment. And that can be a lot of different things, ranging from unwelcome comments. Um, you know, and some a joke we have is instead of saying, oh, you look great in that dress, which now you're making a comment about that person's physical appearance, you could say, oh, that dress is really nice. So now you're oh, commenting on an article of clothing as opposed to somebody's potential sexuality there. So that's one of the things about comments. It could be pictures, you know, uh, people put calendars up. Maybe it shouldn't be Playboy magazine calendars all over the office. So it can range from a bunch of different things, but those are the two main categories. Okay. Like when you walk into the auto mechanic's office and <laughs> and you see the calendar, but you know, you're a customer, okay. I'm more worried about walking into the auto mechanics and they charge me $400 to change the radiator yes. instead of two. Yes, yes. Which is another fun form. Yes. Mm -hmm. Maybe one day we'll talk about that, too. Uh -huh. And the notion, the notion of a hostile work environment is that the, the sorts of conduct that Cecilia is describing, um, in essence, changes the, the conditions under which you work. It's, it's, uh, it can be, like she said, pictures. It can be comments. It can be things asking people about their sex lives, asking people personal information about them. Uh, you know, putting up screensavers of you know pictures of you know nude women. It can be it, as 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 big as the imagination of the harasser can be, mm -hmm. but it ultimately creates an environment where the individual who's the victim of it, and it's usually women, but it doesn't have to be. It, there can be men who are sexually harassed as well. It changes the the nature of the work. It affects your ability to do your job. But also, isn't it a question of of intent to I mean, you can walk into somebody's. I, I, I'm not a proponent of this, by the way. I'm asking a question for the for the <laughs> viewers here. Uh, you walk into someone's office, and there's this. Let's say there's this calendar up, and it mm -hmm. obviously is making you feel really uncomfortable. 
uh, the person could say, well, my intent wasn't to make anybody uncomfortable, then what do you do? So the interesting thing is, under the law, the actor's intent is completely irrelevant. It's really, how does the victim feel about it? Does the victim find it to be unwelcomed? Okay. And does the victim find it to be something that is commentating, commentating on that person's sex? And then you have, you know, what you need there. So really it's the unwelcome piece. It is how severe is it? How frequently is it happening? Mm -hmm. um, who is the actor? You know, if it's your boss, it's a bit more severe than just your coworker. Mm -hmm. Equally as, you know, uncomfortable sometimes. But if it's your boss, that person has power over you. And that power dynamic plays into severity. So even if, you know, your boss comes in and thinks everybody likes a good off-color joke, and everybody in the room laughs, and you're the only person out of 10 who feels uncomfortable, and your boss never intended to make you feel uncomfortable. Because you felt uncomfortable, you know, it falls into the category of prohibited conduct. Yeah, okay. it, it frequently happens that when somebody makes a complaint and you go to the alleged harasser, the, one of the first things the alleged harasser says is, it was a joke, I didn't mean anything by it, and that's not a defense. Mm -hmm. Okay. and and. So then as, as a result of the Me Too movement, at, this has all been highlighted uh, wonderfully. At, but have there been any, any changes in the law or, or what's been happening in, in the environment now so that's beneficial, that's helpful for, for, for well, mostly women? That, that what, what is, what's, what's been occurring? So there's been a lot of changes since the Me Too movement. The Me Too movement kind of caught like fire with that tweet that resulted in, you know, I think it had 12 million posts and a million tweets of just retweeting the word, who else has this happened to? Me too. And that, you know, really pushed this issue to the forefront very quickly for legislatures. And the federal government has always had, you know, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. But now we've seen states across the country develop their own state laws. And in New York, we have you know the New York State Human Rights Law, as well as the New York City Human Rights Law. And you know, in, two, in 2017 or 2018, it got signed by Mayor de Blasio, which is the Stop Sexual Harassment in New York City Act. And that was really one of the very first of its kind in our country to push this issue. It's one of the broadest laws. It's a strong law. I think California is right there with us and other states are following. But what it's done is it's expanded the protections and for women, for men, whoever's being sexually harassed in the sense of now your employer has to train people annually on what is sexual harassment, how can you report it, what will be done with your report, what agencies are available to you. And they also have developed policies. So all of your employers will have policies in their handbooks that go directly to this issue with a model complaint form. So one of the most overwhelming things can be, how do I report this? What do I say? Who do I go to? And you'll be trained on that every year. You will have a policy available to you that you can walk through the steps. And you'll have a form that you can fill out. And that helps make a very daunting process a little more manageable. And the other interesting thing about the law, too, is that it expanded your protections. So, you know, I don't think everyone realizes now that a client can sexually harass you when you're out on a work assignment. A vendor can, but you're protected. So it expanded that to you as long as you're out doing something on employer business, whether you're on company property or not, you're protected. Interns are protected. So that helps as well. And the other really big piece, too, is the statute of limitations has been increased. So usually- That's really important. Right, so you know things happen and you could feel rushed for time when originally it was one year from the date of the last incident. Um, now you have three. So you, know, you have the time to get everything in order that you need, figure out how you feel, talk to people. Knowledge is the most powerful thing. So I think those are some really big changes in the law. Those those are huge. I think they're they're big advancements so the that women feel that they have recourse. I don't know, Deborah. What do you? Well, I, you know, it's funny. I just saw an article about um, a float that was in the Rose Bowl parade yesterday, 
and it was you know honoring 100 years since women got the right to vote. Mm -hmm. So we've gotten the right to vote. Now there's some acknowledgement of what's been decades, decades, decades upon decades long um, harassment of women, and pr particularly I'm thinking about the entertainment industry where this was really true, and the fact that we don't still have an Equal Rights Amendment passed for women. Now there are enough states who have approved of it, but because it's such a long period of time since that started, it's all, you know everybody's going to have to say it again. Somebody's going to have to bring it up, and and champion it to get it done. But but three of the four people around this table don't have rights under the Constitution, because it all says men, and although men may have at one point um, meant mankind, it doesn't fall out that way. It oh, just you, doesn't fall out that way. You mean because it way. says men and not women? Because it does not say women. In these days, that will be a point legally, Rory, would you say that's a point that is taken into to task? And when you go into some that, that, that they don't go, they say technically, blah, blah, blah. Well, there's no, there's no constitutional protection. I mean, the Equal Rights Amendment got its legs, you know, 20, 30 years ago um, on the notion that, you know, you needed to, to make sure that women had the same protections that everybody else did men, mm -hmm. under, under the Constitution. Part of the reason that people opposed it was that a lot of those protections, while they're not in the Constitution, have, been in, have now been embodied in you know, state and federal law. So for example, Cecilia was referring to Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. That prohibits discrimination on the basis of gender in employment. There are other, there are other parts of that law that prohibit discrimination in, for example, women's sports in, in colleges where Universities now can't fund the football team or the basketball team, and not for the men, but not provide equal funding for women. There are um, things having to do with uh, students, and you know things like sexual misconduct and all sorts of things. So women are women have achieved a substantial amount of protection under the law, but not on, not under the Constitution as the Equal Rights Amendment contemplated it. You know, the other thing Cecilia was talking about before, which has changed a little bit, is that the um, definition of sexual harassment has been liberalized in a lot of ways. I mean, the old standard under federal and New York state law and under many state laws was that, uh, and, and as Cecilia mentioned, that the, the conduct has to be severe and pervasive as well as unwelcome. There were those three elements. So it couldn't happen, and again, you know, something doesn't have to happen more than once if it's sufficiently severe. I mean, if somebody is sexually assaulted, you don't have to have them, well, it only happened once. But when you're talking about comments, jokes, inappropriate pictures, things like that, it had to be pervasive. It had to happen a lot. And severe was, you know, to some degree in the eye of the beholder, but, you know, is this something that the average person would find offensive? And then it had to be unwelcome because there's nothing in the law that prohibits consensual relationships between people in the workplace. And that's still largely the law in, in federal law. It was never the New York City law. City law never required severe and pervasive. And within the last, I don't know, year, um, Governor Cuomo signed a uh, revised New York State human rights law that did away with the severe and pervasive requirement. So now you don't have to say this happened 10 times or this was really terrible. It can be something, and I think Cecilia used the expression from the law, like trivial slights and what was it? Petty and trivial slights. Petty and trivial slights. And so it's it's a much more liberal standard to be able to make a claim uh, for sexual harassment, and that's and that's a that's a significant difference uh, in terms of the ability to not only uh, you know make a complaint but actually to to prove a claim. The other thing is that um, we were talking about company policies. Company policies are frequently stricter than the law. I mean, the law imposes, like, if you will, a minimal threshold, but many companies have policies that impose additional requirements beyond what the law requires. Which is good. Which is good. And so what might not be a violation of the law may be a violation of company policy, and so someone can engage in conduct that might subject them to discipline or termination from their employer that wouldn't amount to a violation of one of the anti-discrimination laws. And an example of that is, is some companies have policies that say, if you are dating somebody of unequal rank, so 
you know, take the law firm context. If I'm a partner in a law firm and I'm dating another partner, that's fine. But if I'm a partner in a law firm and I'm dating an associate, like Cecilia is an associate, if I were dating Cecilia, the company requires you, or dating a secretary or dating a paralegal, the policy is I have to disclose that relationship because the, the perception is, and it's, it's a correct one, is that those relationships are inherently unequal and are inherently coercive because while they may very well be consensual, it may feel that if I ask out my secretary or I ask out a, a, an associate, a junior lawyer who's working with me, they may feel that they have to say yes because I'm in a position of power. And that's true throughout whatever the industry is. you know. So there are company policies that require that. Even in the severe and pervasive days, companies didn't always require that you do something 10 times mm -hmm. or you do it you know, as soon as something was brought to the attention of the, of the appropriate people they would take corrective action, which might not involve termination, might involve something short of termination, but they would they would deal with it um, at a level that was you know short of what the law prohibited. So you basically were answering the, a question that we had, which are there any differences between the law and company policy? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And so let's just go now and make it more personal. So. Uh, I feel like I've been sexually harassed. What do I do? How do I make a complaint? So the first place to look now that the law has mandated that you have these policies in place is for your company's policy. So whether that's made available to you through an intranet, um, if it was handed to you and you lost the paper copy, go to HR, just say, hey, I want to see the employee handbook. Um, take a look at that policy. So under the state and city law, it really has to lay out for you how you do this. So that's really helpful. So it says, okay, you can go to a manager or you can go to HR. Those are generally the, the two places you can go. But you would recommend that you, you do that because, I mean, that's a scary thing. Somebody, right. first of all, it's a, it's a highly unpleasant experience and then you're like, oh my God, you know, now I have to tell somebody. <laughs> One of the things that I always, you know, recommend, especially as a woman in the workplace, is find someone, it doesn't necessarily have to be your manager, but somebody who is a little higher up in the company or wherever you work who might have some political pull, and even if they don't, just someone you feel comfortable with, who you can go to and say, hey, this happened. I just want to talk to you about it. What did? What do you think? What do you feel about it? What should I do? And that person usually can help you through the entire process, which is really nice, and it, it helps make the process a bit more comfortable. So that's one of the, the biggest things that I always recommend is find somebody like that. Um, but, but ultimately, you do have to go to HR. Yeah, but the, the, the problem sometimes is that people who are harassed are reluctant to come forward for a whole host of reasons. Um, they don't want to get somebody in trouble. They don't want to become the object of attention. People will think that, you know, they're a tattletale or they're not, you know, the go along to get along theory. Um, and so it, it can be it can be daunting, and it can be daunting for you know not just uh, for well educated, well you know experienced people. It's a pretty common reaction. So if if you can follow Cecilia's advice, and there's somebody that you can talk to who's going to you know, give you positive reinforcement. No, I mean, it's not your fault. You're not, you're not gonna get somebody fired. They've, they've put themselves in this position by the way that they've behaved. That may facilitate you know, the person being more comfortable in bringing it to the attention of the appropriate people. And that the, the person they talk to can conceivably be uh, you know, a supporter, you know, someone who can also you know, weigh in on that process. But you're right, ultimately you have to make a formal complaint and part of that is that um, as part of the training, uh, the, the training will always include assurances that you won't be retaliated against for making that complaint. And the, the, you know, retaliation is basically taking some kind of an adverse job action against you um, because you have an absolute right to make a complaint under the law. And if you make that complaint, you're protected against retaliation. So the training should include assurances that, you know, you won't be retaliated against, that no actions will be taken against you. Um, and that's the, you know, the assurance that you get. Again, it's a difficult thing to make that complaint because frequently people will say, well, I, you know, so-and-so did such-and-such, but I don't want my name used. I want this to be kept confidential. Well, 
you know, sometimes you can and sometimes you can't because don't forget the accuser has rights too because not every complaint of sexual harassment is true or accurate. Um, and yet the, the company needs to conduct an investigation and that includes at some point talking to the accused. You know, someone has accused you of whatever. Um, and that person, you know, at least if you have to deal with the fact that they're going to say, well, who accused me? You know, what did I do? Where did I do it? I don't remember doing anything. I don't think I did anything. Uh, so confidentiality is, is something you can't assure somebody, oh, your name will never come out. That sometimes makes people uncomfortable because they don't want to be, you know, the subject of, did you hear Mary made a complaint and she's got Bob in trouble? And, you know, why did she do that? And Bob's such a good guy. So there's a lot, there's a lot of conflicting things that go on. But again, my view has always been, you know, the person has put themselves in this position. You assume that people are making these complaints and, you know, honestly and in good faith. And all you can do, as Cecilia is describing, is create an environment where people feel that they can come forward and make the complaint because the company has made it clear that they won't tolerate this behavior. They've engaged in the training that Cecilia described. They have a, a support system, if you will, within the, within the company that people they work for, people they know, people in positions of authority who can be supportive of them and encourage them to do the right thing. But yes, ultimately the person has to sort of say, I am going to go to human resources and make, the, and make the complaint, however the complaint procedure is laid out. And obviously you can complain to your manager except if you think your manager is the person who's sexually <laughs> harassing you, yeah, then, yeah. then you're not going to go complain to your manager, but that's right. why you can always go to human resources. Right. And two things to kind of be aware of there, too, is, you know, the state and the city have changed its law to have mandatory reporting. So if you do go to a supervisor and manager and you talk to them about this, they're legally obligated to go to HR. So don't be shocked um, or feel betrayed if you tell a manager, hey, this happened to me, they have to go to HR, and you should expect that it should go to HR. And, but um, that's also a good thing, because yes. then you know they're not going to keep it a secret right. either. Right. They have to, because they'll have a liability too. Right. right. And many company policies require employees to report sexual harassment that they observe. So That's an important point. So if, you know, if you're working in a company and you see, I don't know, let's say, um, a manager inappropriately touching a subordinate or making inappropriate comments to a subordinate, you're obligated, although you've done, you have no involvement in that, either as the harasser or the victim, you are obligated to report that to HR and say, hey, you know, I just saw, you know, Bob touching Mary and that seemed inappropriate to me. So there's that requirement as well, which again is something that, you know, was frequently true in many companies or true in many companies before this mandatory requirement under the current state and city law that you had to report these things to HR. And the rationale, as you just said, is to avoid the notion of somebody complains to the manager and because of personal relationships or friendships with it at particular levels, oh, I complain to you about somebody else and you're friends with that person and you say, well, gee, all right, you know, I'll try to resolve this and sweep it under the rug. And so the company never actually finds out about it at the appropriate level. This is designed to make sure that the HR people who should be, you know, sort of neutral in all this and not involved and there to enforce the company policies in a uniform and even-handed way, they find out what's going on. Now, all of these policies and all that you're saying should be instituted within organizations. Mm -hmm. The organization is also then responsible for training um, and educating their employees so that at least there's a modicum of understanding by the em every employee mm -hmm. about what their recourse is and what the steps are and mm -hmm. what what they can do um, under those those circumstances. Well, you know, I, I don't work in an environment of a structured corporation, a structured business mm -hmm. offices, big guys' office, little people's work areas and things like that. But I've been required recently to do a video mm -hmm. sexual harassment training, and it has to be complete, completed before I can go work. So one, this one instance I'm talking about is I work at a hospital in a program that uh, trains uh, medical students in you know their three years of mm -hmm. medical training and we work with them so they can learn how to actually deal with a human being you know see what comes up for them when when they're working with them and getting their their skills uh, set together so we don't have 
necessarily the stepping ladder of all the various people to go to, and they do videotape these encounters because, you know, of course, it'll help the student learn. But when you're in a less mm, structured environment, mm -hmm. sometimes it gets a little dicey about who do I go to, um, because also in, in most of the work situations I'm in, you don't want to mess up stuff because, you know, there's so many other people standing right behind me to take this job. If not even, you know, are they problematic or they're not strong enough, it's just like we don't have time. Mm -hmm. Just simply male, female, dog, cat, elephant, doesn't matter, we don't have time, move her to the side, take the next one in line behind. Mm -hmm. So w it's interesting to me that when we talk about the things and the rules and how they're laid out, it seems very... There it is, it gets done, it's good. I'm curious as, as to um, how many people can resolve things and stay anonymous, or does it always come out? And I'm sure that it has to do with the severity of the problem as well, but do you have any idea from cases y'all are dealing with of things that, or companies, you know, are particular companies really good at resolving without revealing and yet being able to make a better workplace? Well, it's a toughie. Well, well, it's like it three questions in <laughs> one, too. Sorry. It, it, no, it's, no it, it's, it's a, really a good, good it's question. It's a good question. There's a few because, pieces to it, because too. Because even though yeah. we've touched upon confidentiality, I think that's, I mean, I know that would be my, I mean, we're also in, this, we're in the same entertainment industry, mm -hmm. so it, we're, it's not structured. It's very uh, nebulous. It's it's not linear in well, any way. There's always someone ready to take so your place. So what, like, under you're always the, concerned about that and your reputation. Right. So... To start, I guess, with the very first part of you know what the interesting points you were bringing up. Um, so under the state law, if you just have one employee, you have to have a procedure in place. So they have, in a way, contemplated okay, a smaller, smaller employer or an employer that's not as structured still needs to come up with some sort of a plan. So there, it might not be as robust as some of the things we've been talking about, but they have to have something. And in terms of the confidentiality piece. It really depends on what's going on, which Rory really touched on. So if I'm in a group of people, and I gave this example before, and everyone's making jokes, and they're sexually inappropriate jokes, and everyone's laughing, and I go to HR and I say, you know, this is really inappropriate, I felt uncomfortable by it, what are you gonna do about it? They can actually go to the person and say, hey, we heard you're making some jokes, what's going on with that? They don't need to say, you know, Cecilia said you're making inappropriate jokes. Mm. Because there were other people there. It was, you know, happening in that way. If there's posters in the workplace, we use that example, that's another place where maybe you can be anonymous. It's much harder to be anonymous, as Rory, you know, spoke about previously, when I'm saying somebody did this specific thing to me. Mm. And, you know, that person who is the accused has to have the opportunity to say, did I do it, did I not do it? So the name, your name will come up in that regard. Um, we've done a number of internal investigations to help clients um, go through that process. We've reviewed them, you know, given guidance on that. And the trick language is it's confidential to the greatest extent possible. Mm. And what does that mean, though, right? That's mm. a weird kind of phrase. But what it means is, okay, there were five witnesses to this incident. I don't need to, when I interview them, to say, hey, what happened? Say, did you see so-and-so do X? I can say, you know, how do you like working here? What's, have you ever noticed anything inappropriate? And kind of see if they bring it up themselves, mm -hmm. if they saw anything. And if not, just say, go around the room in a way. Um, you work with five people. What's your relationship with this person? What's your relationship with that person? How do these two interact? And you can kind so of So there's a way to it. finesse it. With Until witnesses. absolutely necessary. Right, with witnesses, not necessarily the accused. Right, because frequently the complaint is made by an individual, not in the circumstance Cecilia describes, but in the circumstance where somebody says, you know, so-and-so did such-and-such to me. And then when you meet with the accuser, because typically the way the investigation runs is somebody makes a complaint, somebody in HR interviews the complainant, gets their side of the story, then we'll usually meet with the, well, then we'll usually meet with the witnesses because they'll ask the accused, who witnessed this, who was there, who saw it, who did you tell? Um, they'll interview all those people. And then when they've done that, you know, sometimes in the modern world, 
people have received emails, text messages. There may be some actual, you know, documentary evidence of, of inappropriate behavior. And then they'll sit down at the end of that with the accused, because now they're armed with all the information they've gathered in the investigation, and they'll say, okay, you have now been, someone has made a complaint about you that you did the following. Now, at that point, depending, sometimes merely saying it reveals who the, the identity of the person is because they've got some relationship with that person, a work relationship or a, or a social relationship. Um, so it's hard in that circumstance to keep things confidential. It's easier to keep the witnesses confidential because they only come out if the thing proceeds. So that is, the confidentiality piece is always the most difficult because it is very common for the person when they show up to make the complaint, open up by saying, you know, I want this to be confidential. I don't want anybody to know that I'm the person making the complaint. And the HR person is sitting there saying, uh, well, to the extent possible, to the extent practicable, we'll do that, but we can't, we can't promise you. Because again, like I said before, the, the accused has some rights on all of this as well, because I have had cases, not many, but I've had cases where somebody has made a false claim against somebody for some vindictive reason. Um, you know, and those reasons, you and know. That, that happens too. Yeah, not often, but no, it does I happen know, know. every once in a while. And you have to be mindful of that. You know, you have to give that person who's accused an opportunity to sort of tell their side of the story. It's not true or the person's exaggerating what happened, et cetera. That's what an investigation involves, you know, finding out all the facts. But, um, you know, where, you know, to, to Deborah's point, if you're working in an organization either where, even though you're required, they're required to have these policies, they don't, or they don't take them seriously, or they don't enforce them, or it's not clear what you're supposed to do. I mean, the, the other option is that there are a number of agencies, government agencies, where you can go and make a complaint that you are being sexually harassed or discriminated against for some other prohibited reason, um, and that will trigger the, the mechanisms of those agencies to you know, make, uh, to conduct their own investigation. Now, obviously, to the extent, you know, Deborah, you were saying, well, there's somebody waiting behind me to take my job. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it takes it up another, another notch because if you just make an internal complaint, you go to HR, what we've been talking about, it gets resolved, if you will, within the family. Mm -hmm. I think um, what I'm thinking about, so there are also unions, and unions will afford you mm -hmm. an opportunity to have some sort of, um, you know, meeting, discussion, resolution. But when you are kind of farther away from that, mm -hmm. and I'm just going to be the performer here, a performer has to go to their union. Mm -hmm. uh, that may be 3,000 know, uh, 3, miles away a phone call you're going to make because you're on location in, you know, uh, Nebraska, yeah. you know, where critters don't even go because it's so damn cold. Um, <laughs> and if having all the rules in place are fabulous, but I think it really comes down to teaching boys and girls when they are young. You know, you don't have to be silent. Mm -hmm. And and if you choose to not be silent, be aware that sometimes there's going to be repercussions. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at you too, there are, I mean me too, there are women who've been saying this for a while and they've been totally blown out of their careers. Mm -hmm. True. Even though everyone knew. Right, Everyone True. knew, but they didn't side with the people who were being, the, the, having these things perpetrated on them. And I think that's why even though passing the ERA mm -hmm. is 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 m m more a um, oh what is the word I want you know it's it's sort of like a a, a stamp that says this is what it is mm -hmm. because you people there are some people out there who are brought up to think women are less than well you know and religions who say women are less than mm -hmm. and cultures that say mm -hmm. women are less than so if you don't have the uh, guts to stand up and say, this is wrong, you did this, this is wrong, mm -hmm. and it needs to stop, then you either leave that profession, leave that religion, leave that country, mm -hmm. leave your family sometimes, mm -hmm. until you can find the strength to do it or find other people who will give you the strength to do it. So the laws are great. It's getting people to use them but is I, a really important no, factor. I think, that, I think that's right, but you know, 
30 years ago, sexual harassment was, I mean, by way of example, a very early sexual harassment case. I went to court, the plaintiff's lawyer stood up and said, you know, these are all the terrible things that happened to my client. Mm -hmm. And the judge looked at me and said, so the plaintiff, what is she, a real looker? Because the mentality was, well, you'd only sexual har sexually harass a good-looking woman. Why because, waste your time on, right, on why, a dog? That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And we all know that sexual harassment has nothing to do with sex. It has to do with power. power. Right. And that's what it's all about. Now, you fast forward you know, 30 years or so today, um, there's a very different mindset. So I think what you're saying is right, but it's still an evolutionary process where, you know, I mean, women still a lot of the time feel that... Um, they don't want to cause trouble. They don't want to be the, the, the uh, object of uh, rumor and gossip. They don't want to get someone in trouble. It's kind of the traditional way. And it's not just true. And they're also of, afraid of getting fired. And it's also, that's right. And it's also not just true of women of, you know, my generation or my parents. It's true of Cecilia's generation, yeah. who's, you know, at least one generation behind me. And, and so that's why I think one of the things Cecilia said before is important that if when this stuff happens and you're sort of like, you know it's wrong and you know you've been offended by it and you may complain to like, you know, your family member, I'm outraged by this, but then when it's time to tell the employer, you sort of, I don't know, downplay it yes. because you don't want to cause that problem. If there's somebody else who's outside of that sort of, you know, chain of command, if you will, you know, you yes. go to your manager, you go... You go to somebody in, in, in your organization and you say, you know, this happened to me. And that person is like, well, that's an outrage. That's wrong. That shouldn't happen. You need to whatever. And that person's also willing to speak up on your behalf yes. and talk to the, the HR people or your manager and say, you know, we can't tolerate this. We can't put up with this. And it can be, an, it can be someone who's, who's uh, in a higher position of you, who's a man, who's a woman. It really doesn't matter. That I think is part of what you're saying, which is changing the culture mm -hmm. of the way in which way in which people react to this stuff. Because, uh, look, there are plenty of women who complain. I mean, I deal with plenty of cases where women have brought lawsuits and women have filed charges with these government agencies I mentioned, claiming that they have been, you know, sexually harassed by their boss, by a coworker, by an outside, you know, vendor, whatever. But I'm sure there are there are plenty of these things that go unreported and complaints are not made for the very reasons we've been talking about. That's exactly. why but that's why I wanted to have this podcast and have the discussion about that this because even though we're not where we want to be or should be, even though we're not where as I don't thump the table. Thank you, Deborah. You see how strongly I feel about this. I do. Even though we're not where we should be or want to be yet we're still at least positively taking steps in the right direction. Yes, I and think it's great that we've yeah. got all this legislation and so, now. And now we're, you know, at least the listeners now are learning about the steps they, they can take mm -hmm. th that do exist, maybe more easily in a more structured environment. However, these things do exist. Yes. And it's better than it was let's say 10 years ago or well, even a year even or two years, two, yeah. two years yeah. ago. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think that's right. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> I um, think too, it's a very interesting conversation because I think most women, at least most of the women I know all have a story about something that happened in the workplace that was sexually inappropriate. And, you know, I've done it. So, you know, I'm just as guilty, but I do know people as well who have had something happen to them and they, do they downplay it they say you know it wasn't a big deal or it was a one-time thing it's it's okay it's not going to happen again and you know maybe we downplay it because you don't want to draw attention you don't want to be the person who got someone else in trouble if you want to be part of the boys club if you're in a male dominated industry and you don't want to be looked at as oh that's the woman causing problems over there you say anything to her she's gonna you know go tell HR and you know, when we do that, though, I think that exactly as Deborah was saying, we're creating a an environment where it may appear that we're welcoming behavior that really is inappropriate, that we need to stand up and say, you know, this is wrong and really be vocal about how wrong it is. But for example, um, at a previous job I had, you know, I was working with some younger women and they were interning 
And one of the women had somebody anonymously put all these flowers and chocolates on her desk, and she was a little weirded out by it and said, you know, I don't know who did this. Um, does anyone have any idea? And I was in the role of being a supervisor to that person. And I was, you know, thinking, do I report this? Because it's anonymous, so if something, God forbid, happened, would I have knowledge of that? And I didn't help her. So, but part of what I at least thought, too, was, oh, I hope she's not mad at me because is she going to be concerned about, oh, she went and complained about this. Mm -hmm. And the, the strange thing was when I, when I did report it, she was pretty upset about that. You know, she was, she was like, well, now people are going to think like I just complain. And I think that's something that, you know, we have to get out of our heads. And because the laws our own insecurities, perhaps our own fears, almost we become silent enablers when we don't realize we're doing that. Oh, is that... Yeah, I think, I think that's right, because you can have a situation where, you know, the, the way, in, and I think I said this before, but the way in which the person who's the victim describes the incident to, you know, a family member, a spouse, a parent, um, the way they may describe it to coworkers, the way they may describe it to people they feel comfortable talking to, and then it somehow it comes to the attention of HR. Maybe they didn't make a complaint, maybe that, you know, someone else saw it, or somehow it came to the attention. And then the HR person who's investigating it dials up that the victim and says, "I understand that such and such happened, and they've heard, you know, these. This was a really, you know, bad thing." And they ask the the victim, and they say, "Well, you know, did this happen?" And they go, the person goes, "Yes." And they go, "Well, you know, were you offended? Were you upset? Did you feel threatened? Did you?" And they go, "No." Mm. And so then the HR person they're saying, "Well, well, what do I believe? I mean, is who's exaggerating what? Who's not being truthful about what?" So to Cecilia's point, I think that you know it's important to to bring that forward and and to be honest about it because you know if people find out in the workplace that if you behave this way you lose your job, it will it will tend to stop people from behaving that way it will because it will it will change behavior, the same way that you know a generation or two ago it was okay to make comments about people who were disabled, about people because of their race, about people because of their where they came from. Now, you know, if you say to somebody, well, would you ever say something about somebody's disability or race or national origin? No, I would never, I would never do that because they know it's unacceptable. It's, it's not only frowned upon, it's, you know, just, it's just unacceptable behavior that results in some pretty serious consequences. That same mentality needs to be instilled, in, and it is in many, in many in organizations, in many circumstances. Uh, will it ever be completely eradicated? No, not like the others have never been completely eradicated. But it, it, it requires a, a change in the mindset of people as to what's appropriate behavior. And I think Rory had a really great point earlier in the conversation, which was, you know, we can, whoever is the victim can't be thinking, oh, me reporting is going to have this negative consequence for that person. That person did that act. Yes. And that person should be held responsible for the inappropriate th thing that they did to you or around you. And um, I think changing that narrative in, you know, my own mind, in women's mind, in men's mind who are subject to it, I think will help, you know, move the movement forward. Okay, well, great. I think we've covered most of it. Do you have any other questions? Well, I was just going to say, this is going to be ongoing forever because one of the other things going on in entertainment is the question of comedians. Now, you've, mm -hmm. got, you've got two pots boiling there because it is a very male dominated area of entertainment and there has been a lot of problem for female comedians and that's been talked about elsewhere and indeed you know um, um, Louis CK you know had some issues and the women came forward and they told it he went sort of out of the picture for a while but after a year he came back in and people saying hey is that too early and I guess everybody's going to be judged by what is in the air at that time. But on the flip side, what, what can we now use in comedy? Comedy used to be very much dominated by making fun of other, mm -hmm. making fun of different. And thank the Lord that's not me, you know? I mean, that goes all the way back to slipping on the banana peel in comedy. Why is it funny? Because it happened to him and not me. 
you know, and that's the laughter, the release of laughter. So what are they going to do in comedy? It's a huge, huge issue. And we don't want to be all regimented and, I'm going to say, uptight or just minding your P's and Q's so much that you have to damp down any personality or any I think you know, joy that you have. It, it's a question of degree, and I think as a society we may go too far one way and then we'll eventually find our balance yeah that's that civility question that is so hard to find when all we have is black and white right mm -hmm. now there's no gray at all right well thank you so much i think uh, we've had an informative discussion so uh we want to end this uh with our usual book recommendation. I thought I'd give a very lighthearted book recommendation Yay. after a serious <laughs> topic, and it's called uh, The Lost Carousel of Provence by Juliet Blackwell. It's um, an intriguing and alluring tale filled with family drama, love loss, romance, secrets, passion, and loyalty. And for you Francophiles everywhere, it's set in the lavender hills of Provence. And... Um, it, uh, it's about a photographer who has an assignment to photograph carousels in Paris. I love carousels. Of course, <laughs> I was drawn to this book, uh, particularly a fabled 100-year-old carousel at a dilapidated Chateau Clamont in Provence. And um, it's just a lovely read, so I thought I'd recommend that. And then we also like to recommend, we'd like to ask our, you know, I thumped again on the table. Um, we like to ask our, our guests three really quick questions. So, Cecilia, what excites you? Um, I would have to say going home to my 120-pound uh, Bernice Mountain Dog. Oh. You walk in the door, and he comes running over, and any bad day instantly becomes good. Yes, a big bowl of fluff. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> Well, you're speaking to dog lovers. Yeah, we're all so, animal lovers so here, much. so we can we, we, we can definitely um, relate to that one. And what peeves you? Well, I guess maybe because it's uh, this time of year, and I work by Rockefeller Center. But when there's a lot of tourists in the city who uh, don't understand on the escalator to the subway, which side you shouldn't stand on, so I can get by. <laughs> <laughs> that just irks me to no end. Yes, they should all stand on one side. One side. Well, we it's the classic, like to get to the right if you're slower. I mean, how hard is that? And uh, um, what advice would you give for the women of today? Be vocal. I think, um, you know, we're in an environment that promotes us being vocal, and there's nothing I love more than seeing other strong women and anyone who's vocal on it and can move rights forward. I think that's the best thing. And there's one last thing for this topic that we wanted to mention. There are some great potential reading materials if anyone wants to further um, research this or find out more information. And it's a website, uh, Women's Rights Brochure, which goes through the various types of discrimination against women. Uh, it's not solely gender discrimination. It's www.nyc.gov. Gov backslash site, backslash CCHR, backslash media, backslash sexual harassment campaign dot page. And there's another one, Worker's Guide, developed by the state, has facts that assist you with complaints with the Division of Human Rights, www.newyork.gov, backslash combating sexual harassment workplace, backslash workers. So thank you again, and remember, remember kindness, kindness counts. counts.